excited uh, that we get to be together. Let me ask you this question. Uh, how many people, both locations, let me see your hand. How many people have started listening to Christmas music? Let me see your hand. Come on, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Everybody look around. You can't trust these people, all right? <laughs> Just make a mental note. You cannot trust these people. Um, but yeah, so we're starting a, a brand new series today called Dollars and Cents. And, and what we're going to do over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about money. And specifically, we're going to talk about our relationship with God and our relationship with money. Our relationship with God and our relationship with money. Uh, and you may not say it that way or think of it that way, but here's what I can promise you. You have a relationship with money. And, uh, and your relationship with God should change your relationship with, with money. And so we're going to talk about that. Now, our heart is always to be as helpful as possible. We, wanna, we don't want to just preach at you. Uh, we want to walk with you. That's always our heart. That's always our goal. And, and so as a part of this series, what we're hoping is that this is just an on-ramp, uh, just a helpful nudge, a helpful push uh, for you to take steps uh, to manage your money better, to have a plan, how you spend it, uh, how you save it, what you do with it. We're going to be talking about some of that. But, but this is really just a first step uh, an on-ramp for you, and, and we are excited to be announcing today that we are launching another semester of our Financial Peace University class. This is going to start on January the 8th. Now, this is going to be hosted at our South Louisville location, but it is open to all of our locations, wherever you are, even if somebody's not a part of our church, but you think they would want to be a part of this, they can, they can be a part of it. Uh, but we, we love FPU. Uh, I think, I should have confirmed this before I said it, but I'm almost positive all of our staff has been through it. Most of our leaders have been through it. And uh, we believe in this. And, and I, I asked our leaders of FPU this week if they could give me just some, some, some updates on what FPU has done and how it has helped our church. And these just blew my mind. I want to share them with you. That we have had over 50, uh, 55, 56 families who have graduated over the years from FPU. And those families have paid off $232,537, uh, let us try this again, $232,537.45. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's better than that, but that's okay. And then uh, they have saved $301,010.70. So that is a positive financial turnaround of $533,548.15. That is, now is a good time to clap. That's incredible. Uh, and we want you to be a part of that. So whether you feel like you could use a little bit of work or you need a lot of work or a lot of help or just somebody to kind of get you organized or, or whatever it is, we would love for you to be a part of this FPU class that is launching. And January is a great time, too, because, you know, you're motivated. You want to get organized, get your life together, and what better way than money. So uh, if you want to participate in this, the best way for you to register and sign up is to use the church app. Uh, just use the church app. On the front page there will be a link where you can register and handle everything through the FPU website. Uh, we are just going to facilitate it and host it. And so whether you need to be a part of that at both locations or you know somebody who needs to be a part of that, um, we'd love for you to participate with us, okay? So I, I read a news report this week, true story, it's going to sound like I'm telling a joke, but this is a true story, of a man in Nebraska who walked into a local bank in Lincoln and he wanted to open a new checking account. And so he said, we want to, you know, I want to open a checking account. They took him to the, the desks, you know, with one of the employees and began filling out the paperwork and then... The, the employee asked him, do you have any initial money to open the account with? And he said, well, yes, I do. He reached in his pocket, true story, and pulled out a $1 million bill. Now, in case you don't know, there's no such thing as a $1 million bill. They don't make those. Uh, but he had a $1 million bill, and he just slid it across the desk to the lady and said, yes, I'd like to open the account. She looked at it and said, I'm I'm sorry, I, this, is, this is not real, but the man was adamant that, yes, it is real, and they wouldn't take it, and he stormed out. He took his $1 million bill, and he stormed out. But as I was reading the story, I thought, I could use a $1 million bill. That's what I thought. Uh, anybody, you'd say, I could use one of those $1 million bills. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, we could, we could do that. And the reality is, for the majority of people in the room and in our country, money 
It's not a pleasant topic because it's a painful topic. We are, we're struggling, feeling the pressure and pain of, of, of debt. Here's, here's some stats for you. One-third of all Americans are overdue on their credit card debt. In the state of Kentucky, 42% of all debts are in collection status. Uh, 80% of divorced couples say that money trouble was a contributing factor. Uh, this is my favorite. When surveyed, 75% of people in committed relationships said they would rather have someone who's good with money than someone who's good looking. Huh? Now, if you get both, you hit the jackpot. But 75% of people said if I had to choose, I'd take ugly and good financial sense than handsome and broke, um, which is interesting. So can we all just admit that the playbook that our culture has handed us, or maybe our parents handed us, or maybe our, our brother-in-law handed us, or, or, or maybe some friends have handed us that we're supposed to use to manage and spend and plan our money, it, it isn't working great. It's not working, it's not working too, too well. Now, let me tell you why as a pastor, I love preaching on the topic of money. Because, you know, every time I get up here, I, I'm fairly certain that what I'm talking about, you care about. Like, I hope that's the case. And most of the time, I think, I think I, I'm, I'm tuned into that, I think. But when it comes to teaching on money, there is no doubt in my mind, I am talking about something that all of us need to hear and applies to all of our lives. This is something that we need help with and something that I know for certain that God wants to help us with. And so I, I don't apologize uh, for taking three weeks out of 52 weeks. I, I don't feel bad for taking three weeks to talk about how we feel about our money, how we spend our money, how we give our money, because the reality is making and spending money dominates our life, emotionally, mentally. We lay in bed and think about it. We avoid checking the mail because of it, right? We, we, it, it dominates our lives, and, you know, honestly, we should probably talk about it more. You know, Jesus did. Um, 38 parables Jesus told in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 16 of them were about how to handle money and possessions. One out of every 10 verses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is directly about money. Now, they called Jesus the great teacher because he knew how to teach in a way that made people want to listen and, 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 and lean in. And so it's not a coincidence that he taught on money because he knows we care about it. He knew the people listening cared about it. He knew that thousands of years later in in churches across the country and the world that people would care about it. And so we all need wisdom and help when it comes to our relationship with money. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks in this series together. And I want to start this series off by talking about attitude. Everybody say attitude. attitude. I want to talk about attitude, specifically our attitude with, with money. Now, here, here's the definition of attitude. If you looked it up, this is what it's going to say. Attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling about something that's reflected in a person's behavior. I know a little bit of something about attitude. I'm raising a middle school girl right now, and so I feel as if I could be an expert on this topic of attitude. Um, but the reality is all of us have an attitude about money. We all have a settled way of thinking or feeling about money. And what's interesting is even when our way is wrong, we're still pretty settled in it. We're still pretty locked into it. Even when the way we feel about it is wrong, we still, it's hard for us to change the way that we feel about it. And whatever it is that way we feel about it and think about it is reflected in our behavior. The way that we behave with money tells on us. It gives up our secret the way that we think and we feel about it. So I want to talk about it. And to get started with this conversation about attitude, I would like for you to use your imagination. Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to use our imagination, both locations. Uh, if you want to close your eyes, you can. You don't have to close your eyes. But I, I want you to imagine a scenario. I'm going to put you in it, okay? I, wanna, I want you to imagine a scenario. And in this scenario, you are a financial planner, or, or a life coach, or a spiritual leader, or a coach. You are somebody that your job is to give people advice, okay? And so on this particular day in your office, or your career, you're 
assistant tells you that you have two appointments. The, the first appointment is with an elderly, widowed woman, and she shows up, and she begins to tell you her story. She was widowed six years ago. Her husband passed away, and then she had a little nest egg, but someone took advantage of that and, and, and pretty much stole what she had, and she doesn't have anything left. The only thing she has left is $100. That's all she has. To her name is $100, and she tells you that she has that $100 in her purse. And she feels like God wants her to give it to her church. That's all she's got left. And she feels like God told me, God wants me, God is leading me to give that to my church and she wants to know if you think that's a good idea. She would like your opinion because this is what you do for a living. Do you think that's a good idea that she would give all she has left, which is only $100, to the church? If, if you were put in that position, what advice would you give her? What would you say? If you were anything like me, here's what I would want to say. Here's what I'd want to say. Wow. I mean, that's unbelievable. I love your heart. I know God loves your heart. It's the thought that counts. And so God would not want you to give your last $100. You got to buy groceries. We, we got to figure out. Matter of fact, I need to help you find a place to stay or to go. Is there anybody I can call? Like, I love your heart. I love that you're trying to follow God. I love that you are trying to be sensitive and obedient to God. Wow, thank you. I wish there were more people like you. But let's don't be crazy, okay? Let's don't be crazy. Let's make a good, wise decision. You'd probably say something similar to that. Like, you know, I mean, for most of us, some of you are going to be crazy. You're going to say, like, hey, take it to the boat and play roulette, okay? So that's what some of you are going to say. It's fine. And, and then, but, but most of us are going to say something along the lines of, your heart is amazing, but let's be smart about it, Right? Well, your second appointment that day in this scenario uh, that we're using our imagination is with a, is with a middle-aged, good-looking, successful businessman. He shows up at his appointment. He begins to tell you his story, and he says that um, he started this business about 15 years ago, and it has just taken off, and he's doing incredibly well. His family is doing incredibly well. All of his investments are growing all of his employees love working for him. All of his expansion has worked. He's got the Midas touch. Like it is, it's just working for him. And he tells you that he's a part of a church and he tells you that he gives to charities and he tries to help and he sponsors his kids' ball teams and he, you know, he, he, he tries to, you know, do some generous things with the money. But he also tells you that him and his wife have been talking, and they've decided that they want to tear down the house that they live in now, and they want to build a bigger one. And he wants to know, do you think that's a good idea? So how do you feel about that? What advice would you give him? What advice would you give him? If you're anything like me, here's the advice I would want to give him. Wow, that's unbelievable. I think it's so amazing how God has blessed your life. I think you're Hard work is paying off. I think your wisdom and investments is paying off. I, 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 I'm just excited for you. And, man, if you, if you can afford it, you know, to tear down that house and build another one, like, I say go for it. There would even be a part of me that would want, like, to say something like, I, I hope that I can be in your position one day. I, 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 that would be a pretty amazing life. And as we think about, in this scenario, the advice we would give to the, to, to the widowed woman with $100 left or the successful businessman who can seem to do no wrong, that advice seems to be good advice. It seems to be wise advice. It seems to be reasonable advice. But I wonder what Jesus would say. If a widowed woman with $100 left came to him or a successful businessman came to him with the exact same scenarios, what would Jesus say to, to, to both of those people? Well, unfortunately, we don't know what Jesus said because the Bible doesn't have anything helpful to say to us. I'm kidding. That's not true. The Bible has so many things to say to us about our lives. 
and in the Bible is actually two scenarios that are exactly what I just described to you. Because that's the way the Bible works. The Bible, it talks to us and teaches us practically about our lives right where we are with what we're dealing with and what we're feeling. And so we don't have to guess. Very rarely do you ever have to guess what would Jesus say about it. We know what Jesus would say about it. So I'm going to read a couple of parts of the Bible. This is going to be on your sermon guide as well. Hopefully you grabbed one of those. But the first story about the widowed woman is in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and we're going to start with verse 41. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And this is what it says. It says, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Now, we're going to keep reading, but let's just stop for a second because that's intimidating, right? I mean, it's one thing... It just in general, if like, you know, like a leader is just like watching over the offering, you know, and seeing what you're putting in, you know, that's one thing. But Jesus, can you imagine going to church and be like, oh, who's the new guy? They're like, oh, it's the son of God. And, and it's like, well, what's he doing? It's like, oh, he's just seeing what everybody's giving. Like, that is incredibly intimidating. And it's also really troubling if our attitude about money is that Jesus doesn't care what we do with it. Or how we spend it or how we give it or, you know. He obviously, unapologetically, really cares. And he's watching this because he wants to to teach his disciples, teach us a lesson. So let's keep reading. He's watching. He's just, he's, he's standing there watching what people put in. And then it says, many rich people put in large amounts. Verse 42, then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, here's the lesson he wants to teach. I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has to live on. So, before we read the second story... Based on just the first story, we see that Jesus would give really different advice than the advice that we gave. He, he answers differently than we would. He sees this poor elderly widow give everything she has left, and he doesn't say, baby, poor, you're so sweet. He doesn't say, you know what, let's pass the bucket. Let's get, this, let's get some money together for this lady so she can get some groceries on the way home. He doesn't reach in there and take it out and say, now I know your heart. Here, just take it back. He sees what she did, and he says to his disciples, she understands it. She gets it. She's doing it right. He commends her for what she, she does. Now, before anybody gets nervous, just know that the point of this message today is not that we should all empty our bank accounts every Sunday. Matter of fact, we've got bank account direct deposit slips coming right now down the aisle. No, that's not what we're talking about. This is not even really a message about giving. It's a message about attitude. So, so if you're getting nervous that, like, we're going to ask for your checking account number in a moment, take a breath. Just hang tight because this, we're talking attitude. We're going we're gonna to go a little bit different direction maybe than you would think. So let's look at the second story of the successful businessman. And that one is in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll start with verse 16. Luke 12, starting with 16, okay? Here's what it says. Then he told them a story, talking about Jesus. Jesus tells the story. He says, a rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have, which this is just free advice, has nothing to do with sermon. If you are friends with anybody who talks in the third person, that's a red flag. I just, that's a red flag, okay? It's a red flag. Anyway, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, if we stopped right there, because we're going to read a little bit more, but if we stopped right there, I don't think anybody would have a problem with this story. Like, good for him. He probably went to a good school. 
he probably worked hard. He took a chance. He leveraged his savings account to start a business or to buy a farm. I don't think anybody would read this story and say, that guy's a bad guy. Matter of fact, we probably read this story and think, I would like to be him, right? But look at what Jesus says at his second appointment. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, to which we say, do what? You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. I have to admit, from, from about the time I'm 16 years old or so, that I really committed my life to Christ, every time I would read this story, I would always just have lots of questions. Because what this guy has is what we want. This is the American dream. And what's crazy is that if I stood up here for the next hour and I read both stories to you and just alternated, the story of the widow who gave everything, the story of the, uh, the, the businessman, the widow, the business, I just kept reading it. That's all I did was just read it back and forth. Even after an hour, we would want his life. Even though we know that Jesus commended her and called him a fool. So even if I told you, hey, listen, just a heads up, this first story, Jesus really loved this. He did not like this. I'm going to read it to you. Even though we know he loved this and didn't like this, we'd say, but I want that. I want that. We, we want what he has. We want his life. Even though we know Jesus says he's foolish, why? Why? Why is there this place in our heart that would choose the fool instead of the person that Jesus said she gets it. Well, the reason we would do that is because of our attitude about money. Now, I want to read three more verses, and then we're going we're gonna to be done uh, reading the, the verses. But in Luke 12, where we just were, if you go back to verse 13, right before Jesus told the story that we just read, just three verses, starting in 13, it says, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, talking about Jesus, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? In other words, Jesus is like, I'm not getting involved in like reading the will and stuff, right? 15, then he said, Jesus, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then he tells the story that we just read. So this, this, this guy shows up and says, Jesus, tell my brother to split the money with me. Like, this is, not a, this is not a Bible age problem. This is an every generation problem. Nothing reveals divides and tension in family, and nothing reveals what's in our heart more than divvying up the parents' estate, right? And so he comes to Jesus. He's like, Jesus, get involved in this, man, because my brother's taking my stuff. And Jesus says, I'm not going to get involved in your family drama but let me speak to the underlying issue. The problem is not the will. The problem is your heart, and let me speak to that. And he gives us a warning. Watch out. Watch out. Beware of every kind of greed. And we think greed is just one kind, but there's all kinds of greed. And Jesus says the reason that you're upset about this will is because of the greed that is in your heart. Now, you might be thinking... This is great. Like, I'm exempt from the sermon now because I'm not greedy. Have you seen my house, Jason? I'm not greedy. I live in the South End. I'm not greedy. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not rich. I give to charities. I drive old cars that I pay cash for. I'm not greedy. But greed is not a rich person problem. Greed is an everybody problem. It's an everybody problem. Greed is that little voice in your head that looks at your friend's new home that they invited you over for like a housewarming party, and it's about 400 square feet bigger than yours, and you go, we need to put our house on the market. You know, now would be a good time to sell. That's in there. Greed is that feeling of satisfaction that you get when you pull into your driveway and see the Amazon box on the front steps. Just that endorphin release, right? Greed is that pull in your heart when you hear that the new iPhone 
uh, or the new AirPod Pros are coming out, or the Apple Watch you have is nice, but the new one, you know, can tell if you, you know, fall off a ladder, and you need that, and so, like, you want that. There is this pull in your heart. Greed is the driving desire for more, and what makes it so hard to detect in our lives is that we're surrounded by it, and it is completely normal. So it doesn't feel as if it's wrong because it's normal. We're surrounded by it. Now, for the time that we have left, here's what I want to do. I want to go back and I want to look at the details of this guy's life, and I want to figure out why would Jesus call him a fool? Why would Jesus call him a fool? Well, we know, first detail, we know that he was a successful farmer. So did Jesus call him a fool because he was good at his job? No, no. God created farms and farmers to feed the world. There's nothing wrong with someone being good at farming or accounting or sales or construction or any other job. Whatever it is that you do, you need to know there's nothing wrong with you being great at it. Matter of fact, I would go as far as to say the Bible teaches that, that we want you and God wants you to be the best at it. So that when people say, why are you so good? You say, Jesus. Right? And so, like, being successful and good at your job is not a problem. God wants you to be good at your job. That's not it. The second detail is that we know he had wealth. Now, this is where it gets tricky because depending on what kind of church you were raised in or family you were raised in, it's easy to believe that the problem with this guy was he had money. Even culturally now, uh, you know, it, it's very easy to look at people with money and say they're the problem. To, to look at people with money and say, well, well, obviously, you know, the only way you get money is to do something wrong or illegal or to take advantage of people, right? And so maybe that's what it is. Maybe Jesus agreed, and the problem is that he was wealthy. Well, that's not why Jesus called him wealthy. As people who believe in Jesus, we believe that God is our provider. So if this man had wealth, we believe that God gave it to him. We even believe that people who don't follow Jesus, who have money, that, that the resources that all of us have, whether you follow Jesus or you don't, we believe that God is our provider, that God orchestrates the pieces of our life. And so we believe that people who have, have because God has provided them. And even if they have gotten it through uh, wrong means, we believe that God is going to use that for a reason or to teach a lesson or to, or to do something across generations that we're not even in tune with knowing what God is doing. So we don't look at people with money and say, well, God's really mad at them. We look at people with money and say, God's doing something. God's up to something. And so if he had wealth, we believe God gave it to him. Everybody listen to me. Having money is not evil. Having money is not evil. And if I, if I would be honest with you, in my own life and in, and in so many of the people that I know, it's the people without money who are way more greedy than the people who have money. I know people with money. I know people who don't have money. The people without money are way greedier than the people who have money. And so be careful that you don't in your heart think money equals evil. Money is paper. Money is metal. Money is, is, is I don't know, is it copper? I don't know what it is, but you know what I mean. It's, 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 it's just materials, right? Value is placed on it by the government, and then even more value is placed on it by our hearts. But it's just, it's just money. And, and here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that, that it's not evil and that hardworking, wise people will prosper. So it's also entirely possible that if you see somebody in your life who has money, they may be incredibly hardworking and wise and have been smart with their money. Most of the people who act like they have it don't have it. And most of the people who don't act like they have it have lots of it, right? And so just be careful that you judge somebody's, you know, wealth by what they drive or whatever that is. Jesus is not concerned with that element of this guy's story. If he's not a fool because he's good at his job or successful or wealthy, why did Jesus say it? Well, Jesus said it because of his attitude about money. Now, it's so subtle that, that you probably didn't even see it in the story. 
It's so subtle that we can believe that God's desire for our life is exactly what this man had. Look at what he had. A successful career, home ownership, saving for the future, and eventually retirement. What's wrong with that? He had success, home ownership, saving for the future, and retirement. That's amazing. If we're not careful, we can make the American dream God's dream for our life. But that's not necessarily, it's not necessarily true. And this man looks at what he has, and he's like, man, you've done good. He's talking in the third person to himself. He calls himself my friend. So he says, my friend, you've done good. Kick back, retire, enjoy what you've got. That's what he's saying, right? What's wrong with that? It's a valid question, and the answer is nothing. Man, you got a lot, tear it down, build bigger ones, enjoy it, eat good, live good, that's great. What's wrong with that, Jason? Nothing. If there's no eternity. Nothing. If there's no resurrection. Nothing if believers don't go to heaven. If there's nothing after this life, then hear me. Enjoy and maximize the enjoyment of this life. Live it up. Eat as good as you can. Buy everything you can. Build it as big as you can. Because there's nothing after. But if there is a resurrection and if there is eternity and if people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ have thousands and millions of years to live for after this life, then this life and what we have in this life is not what's most important. Now, that's not just me saying this. I want you to know. It's not just Jason coming up with something. This is actually what the Bible says. I want to read it to you. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just one verse. It's what the Apostle Paul said. Look at this. Apostle Paul said, and if there's no resurrection, let's party it up. If there's no resurrection, let's feast and let's drink, because we're all going to die. It's a morbid view of life, but it is a phenomenal philosophy if you believe that there's nothing after this life. If there's no eternity or resurrection or our hope in Jesus doesn't promise us a life to come, then why are you wasting a Sunday morning in church? Why would you put money in the offering? Why would you give to help somebody who's down on their luck? Don't waste your money on any of those things. Go buy another boat. Another house. Do it. There's no point to not if there's no resurrection. And that's exactly what the man said in the story. Build bigger barns, eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus shows up and is like, okay, let's play this out. You die tonight. What you got? That's what happens. Jesus shows up. And says, you're a fool because you're going to die this night. And then what do you got? A big estate for a judge to hand out to people? And when you die, Jesus says, now I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus says to this man, when you die, there's going to be two scales that judge your life. He was rich in this world or he was rich towards God. Now, Jesus did not say that you can't be rich in this world and rich towards God. He just said in this man's life, his focus and what was most important to him was being rich in this world. Right? That's what he said. People who believe in Jesus should have a different attitude about money than people who don't believe in Jesus. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't feel and behave and think the same way about this life. Jesus told the man, you're a fool because what's most important to you is being rich instead of rich towards God. In other words, Jesus was saying, you want to use your wealth to make your life better instead of use your wealth to make God bigger. So I'm not just talking about managing our money better. I'm not just talking about giving in the offering. I'm talking about 
why we would manage our money better and why we would give in the offering. And the why is because we believe in Jesus. We are saved because of Jesus. And so as people who believe in Jesus, we want to manage our money better so that we can be 100% obedient to whatever we feel like God is leading us to do, that we don't have to say no because we can't manage our money. We give in the offering not because we want to check something off a list or be considered noble. We give in the offering because we believe that it affects a person or a family's eternity forever. We believe this stuff. This is not a moral code of behavior. We believe it, and we believe it so much that it transforms the way that we think and feel about the things of this world. And it should look differently than people who don't believe what we believe. And so I want to just finish today by asking you three questions. I'm going to ask you three questions to just challenge our attitude about money. Maybe this would be the start for us to have an attitude adjustment about about our money. Here's the first question. Would someone who saw how I spent my money assume that God is my treasure? Would someone who saw how I spent my money assume that God is my treasure? Like if they got close enough, like if they knew the numbers, if they saw the statement, what would they say is most valuable valuable to me? There would have been seasons where if someone saw the numbers, they would say what Jason, what's most valuable to Jason is his golf handicap. In other seasons, they would say, you know what's most important to Jason is his child's athletic career. Because I'm looking through the numbers here, and and, and if, and if, if where your treasure is, there your heart is, and where your heart is, there your treasure is, if the direction of your money reveals the direction of your heart, there have been seasons where if somebody saw my numbers, they would say, Jason's heart is invested in a child's athletic league or a golf handicap. Or a bigger house or whatever it is. Nothing wrong with any of those things. As long as a believer in Jesus recognizes that they have no value in the things that matter. So, first question, would someone who saw how I spent my money assume God is my treasure? Let me ask you another question. Second question, am I saying no to something I want to do with my money? So I can say yes to something God wants me to do with my money. Has your belief in Jesus affected your decision making about your spending? This is bigger than just money. And we're going to be talking about this as we get into the new year in January. But it's worth asking, has my faith in Jesus forced me to say no to something that I want to say yes to? Not because I'll get in trouble or some moral guideline of behavior, but because a faith and a belief in Jesus is so important to me and so changing me that even though I want to say yes to this, I'm going to say no because I want to say yes to God and what he is challenging me and leading me to do. See, I, I believe, and this is a big statement, maybe I'll have to you know, step back from this at some other time, but I believe if however long you've been following Jesus, if you've never had to say no to something because of your belief in Jesus, I'm not sure you're following Jesus. I think you may be asking him to follow you. Let me ask you one more question. How much of my monthly income is spent on things that will last forever? How much of my monthly income is spent on things that will last forever? Now, we know people who are smart with money will tell us, don't waste your money on sinking uh, you know, assets or expenditures or whatever it is. Like, don't, when you pull it off the lot, it loses value. When, you know, a new phone's coming out next year, whatever it is, invest in things that increase in value. That's what people who are wise with money. But people who believe in Jesus agree with wisdom. The Bible says get wisdom, beg God for wisdom. So we want to do the things that make sense here now, earthly wisdom. But people who believe in Jesus also understand that the greatest growing asset is still not going to be here in 10,000 years. The greatest 
you know, uh, mortgage payment or square footage or renovation or property purchase or whatever, degree, whatever it is. It ain't going to be here in 10,000 years. You say, well, nothing will be here in 10,000 years. What will be here forever? Great question. The Bible tells us that the only thing that lasts forever is the church of Jesus Christ and our souls. That's it. That when everything else goes away, the only two things that will last is the church, because Jesus builds the church, and every human soul in history. So if the only thing that will last forever is God's church and our souls, how much of your monthly income is spent on that? Now, this is not guilt, because we know that guilt is never God convicting us or driving us. God always convicts us to lead us to life. If we hear this and feel shame, it's the enemy because shame is never God. So what you shouldn't hear is, I'm a failure, I'm a bum, I'm a bum. What you should hear is, God has something better for me if I can change the way I think and feel about money. And so my prayer, my hope, we've got two more weeks of this. Hopefully you'll come back, I don't know is that there would be an attitude adjustment in us. I believe in Jesus, so I don't think about, spend, plan, or save my money the same way as someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. Because I believe in eternity. Let's pray. God, thank you. For Jesus. Thank you, God, that you modeled to us the greatest attitude and sacrifice when it comes to giving. When you gave Jesus to come to this earth, to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, so that we could have a relationship with you. So God, I pray that every person who is hearing my voice right now would be challenged and convicted by the Holy Spirit to review their attitude, their thoughts, their feelings about money, their desire to be rich now, their, their, the, the things they believe that will make them happy or fulfill them now. God, is the way that we feel about money and possessions and things, does it line up with eternity? Are we building treasures for this earth? Are we building treasures for the life to come? Help us to believe, God, that what you have for us is better than some short-term purchase, account, benefit, enjoyment now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.